Hello, and welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's webinar on Regulation C and the amendments made by the Bureau in 2015. This is the first in a series of HMDA-related webinars that the Bureau will present to help institutions understand and comply with the rule. In today's webinar, we will provide an overview of the HMDA final rule with a specific focus on institutional coverage, transactional coverage, data disclosure, and the submission process. We will also go over some key dates related to the final rule that you should keep in mind. Before we begin, we need to let you know that this presentation is not a substitute for the rule. We cannot amend the rule by webinar. Although efforts have been made to ensure the accuracy of this webinar's content, the rule and its official interpretations provide the complete and definitive information regarding requirements. Throughout this webinar, we refer to the official interpretations either generally as commentary or as individual comments. This presentation is current as of June 30th, 2016. Now, let's begin. Let's start with some background information on HMDA and Regulation C. HMDA was enacted by Congress in 1975 and implemented by the Federal Reserve Board's Regulation C in 1976. HMDA's purposes are to collect information about home mortgages in order to help determine whether financial institutions are serving the housing needs of their communities, assist public officials in distributing public sector investment to attract private investment to areas where it is needed, and assist with the identification of possible discriminatory lending patterns and enforcement of anti-discrimination laws. So, who uses HMDA data? Public officials use the data to develop and allocate housing and community development investments, respond to market failures, and monitor whether financial institutions may be engaging in discriminatory lending practices. Communities use the data to ensure that lenders are serving the needs of individual neighborhoods. Participants in the mortgage industry use the data to inform them of business practices. HMDA and Regulation C have been updated and expanded over time in response to the changing needs of homeowners and the evolution of the mortgage market. In 2010, Congress enacted the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, also known as the Dodd-Frank Act. The Dodd-Frank Act amended HMDA by transferring rulemaking authority from the Federal Reserve Board to the Bureau and adding new reporting requirements. The Bureau issued a proposal to amend Regulation C on July 24, 2014 to implement the Dodd-Frank Act amendments, require the collection, recording, and reporting of additional information to further HMDA's purposes, and modernize the manner in which institutions report HMDA data. The Bureau received approximately 400 comments and carefully reviewed and considered those comments. The Bureau issued the final rule on October 15, 2015. The final rule changes the type of financial institutions subject to Regulation C, the types of transactions subject to Regulation C, the data that financial institutions are required to collect, record, and report, and the processes for reporting and disclosing the data. Today, we will cover the types of financial institutions and the types of transactions subject to Regulation C under the final rule. We will also review information regarding changes to the data submission process and disclosures, as well as go over the dates that various parts of the final rule become effective. Let's begin with institutional coverage. An institution is required to comply with the rule only if it meets the definition of financial institution as defined by Regulation C in Section 1003.2. The final rule changes the scope of institutional coverage in two phases. The first phase is effective on January 1, 2017. This first phase narrows the scope of depository institutions subject to Regulation C. 
A depository institution is a bank, savings association, or credit union. Under this first phase, a depository institution will not be required to collect, record, and report HMDA data unless it meets the asset size tests, location tests, loan activity tests, federally related tests, and it originates at least 25 home purchase loans, including refinancings of home purchase loans, in both 2015 and 2016. The only change for 2017 is the addition of the threshold of at least 25 home purchase loans, which means that the institution must have originated at least 25 of them in 2015 and then at least 25 again in 2016. To get a better idea, let's walk through the 2017 HMDA Institutional Coverage Chart available on the Bureau's dedicated HMDA Implementation webpage. The website address is listed on this slide. The first step is to determine whether the institution is a bank, credit union, or savings association. If it's neither of these, then it would fall under other mortgage lending institution. Note that for 2017 data collection, there are no changes from the current rule that affects other mortgage lending institutions. Therefore, an institution that is not a depository institution would follow the same coverage criteria for data collection in 2017 as it does under the current rule in effect today. Now if the institution is a bank, credit union, or savings association, most of the coverage tests will not change under the final rule. The institution will apply the same asset size tests, location tests, loan activity tests, and federally related tests to determine whether it is required to collect data in 2017. Note that the Bureau adjusts the asset size exemption threshold for depository institutions annually. The Bureau will announce any adjustments in December of 2016 and will make the announcement available on its website. It will also be available in the Federal Register. Let's review each of these tests. The depository institution would first determine whether its assets on December 31, 2016 exceeds the asset threshold published by the Bureau. This is the asset size test. If the institution's assets exceed the threshold published by the Bureau, then it would move to the next test, the location test. The institution would need to determine whether it has a home or branch office in a metropolitan statistical area known as an MSA as of December 31, 2016. If the institution does have a home or branch office in an MSA on December 31, 2016, then it moves to the next test, which is a loan activity test. Here, an institution would look at its lending activity in 2016 and see if it originated at least one home purchase loan or a refinancing of a home purchase loan secured by a first lien on a one to four family dwelling. If the institution does meet the loan activity test, then it will move on to the next test, the federally related test. Here, the institution would need to meet one of the following. It is federally insured or regulated, or looking at the mortgage loan that was considered when determining whether the institution met the loan activity test, the mortgage loan was either insured, guaranteed, or supplemented by a federal agency, or the mortgage loan was intended for sale to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. If an institution satisfies those tests, the institution will look to see if it originated at least 25 home purchase loans, including refinancings of home purchase loans in 2015, and then originated at least another 25 in 2016. Before we explain this last test, which is a loan volume test, Let's review the definition of home purchase. Note that the definition will not substantively change under the final rule. A home purchase loan is a loan secured by and made for the purpose, in whole or in part, of purchasing a dwelling. This means that the proceeds of the loan must be used towards the purchase of a dwelling and the loan is secured by a lien on a dwelling. Now back to the loan volume test. 
This test becomes effective for depository institutions beginning on January 1, 2017. The threshold of 25 home purchase loans is intended to reduce the burden on depository institutions. If the institution did not meet all of the tests that we have described, then it will not be required to collect 2017 HMDIT data. Note that this particular loan volume test for depository institutions is temporary, and it is only effective for one year. As we will see later, the loan volume test changes again beginning on January 1, 2018, and it affects both depository and non-depository institutions. We will also cover how you determine whether an institution has originated a particular transaction for the purposes of Regulation C and the coverage criteria. The second phase changes the scope of institutional coverage under the final rule and becomes effective beginning on January 1, 2018. The rule continues to have separate coverage tests for depository institutions and non-depository institutions, but the rule includes a second phase. The second phase adopts the same loan volume threshold test for both depository institutions and non-depository institutions. An institution, whether it is depository or non-depository, will be required to comply with Regulation C if it originates at least 25 closed-end mortgage loans in both 2016 and 2017, or it originates at least 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017, provided it meets the remaining coverage criteria for either depository institutions or non-depository institutions. We will walk through that test in a moment. Later in this webinar, we will also walk through the definition of closed-end mortgage loan and open-end line of credit, which are new defined terms that become effective on January 1, 2018. It is important to understand these definitions in order to determine whether or not your institution will need to begin collecting data on January 1, 2018. Let's walk through the 2018 institutional coverage chart available on the Bureau's HMDA implementation webpage. First, let's look at the coverage criteria for non-depository institutions. The coverage test for non-depository institutions changed significantly, so all non-depository institutions should carefully study the new test. It's also important to note that it is anticipated that some non-depository institutions that are not currently reporting will be covered under the revised test. The first test is to determine whether the institution is a for-profit mortgage lending institution that is not a bank, savings association, or credit union. This part of the test has not changed. If the institution meets this criteria, then the institution would check to see if it satisfies the location test for non-depository institutions. This part of the test also has not changed. First, the institution would look at its locations and determine whether it has a home or branch office in an MSA on December 31, 2017. If not, the institution would look to see if it received applications for, originated, or purchased five or more covered loans related to property located in the same MSA or Metropolitan Division, known as an MD, during 2017. If the non-depository institution meets either of these two criteria, then we move on to the loan volume test, which is whether the institution originated at least 25 closed-end mortgage loans in both 2016 and 2017, or 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017. Note that beginning on January 1, 2018, the test no longer includes a consideration of a non-depository institution's asset size, nor its home purchase loan originations or refinancings measured in dollars. The emphasis on the loan volume test is on OR. 
The institution would meet the loan volume test if it originates at least 25 closed-end loans in both 2016 and 2017, but did not originate at least 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017. In this case, however, the institution would be required to report information only about its closed-end lending. Conversely, an institution that originates at least 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017, but did not originate at least 25 closed-end loans in both 2016 and 2017, would be required to report information only about its open-end lending. An institution is only covered if it satisfies a threshold for two consecutive years. We call this the two-year look-back period. The two-year look-back period is intended to eliminate uncertainty around reporting responsibilities for institutions that may have an unexpected increase in origination loan volume in one year, but not in the next. The Bureau hopes this will relieve some institutions of significant one-time costs, including staff training and information technology changes related to first-time HMDA reporting. To summarize, if the non-depository institution meets all of the tests that we discussed, then it will be required to collect HMDA data for the 2018 calendar year. This means that it would collect data under the HMDA final rule for the 2018 calendar year and then submit the data by March 1, 2019. If the institution did not meet all of the tests for 2018 reporting, then it will not be required to collect HMDA data for the 2018 calendar year. Next, let's look at the coverage tests for depository institutions. The asset size tests, location tests, loan activity tests, and federally related tests are the same as those for 2017. The change beginning in 2018 will be whether the institution originated at least 25 closed-end mortgage loans in both 2016 and 2017, or 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017. Similar to non-depository institutions, a depository institution would only need to originate either at least 25 closed-end loans in both 2016 and 2017, or at least 100 open-end lines of credit in both 2016 and 2017 to meet this requirement. Now, let's move on to transactional coverage. The final rule modifies the types of transactions that are covered under Regulation C, changing it from a purpose-based test to a dwelling-secure test for consumer purpose transactions. Commercial purpose transactions will need to meet both the dwelling secure test and the purpose-based test to be covered. Transactions covered by the final rule are called covered loans. Covered loans can either be a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit. Whether the transaction involves a closed-end mortgage loan or an open-end line of credit, it must be secured by a dwelling to be covered under the final rule. Section 1003.2D defines a closed-end mortgage loan as an extension of credit that is secured by a lien on a dwelling and that is not an open-end line of credit. Section 1003.20 defines an open-end line of credit as an extension of credit that is secured by a lien on a dwelling and is an open-end credit plan as defined under Regulation Z, Section 1026.2A20, without regard to whether the credit is consumer credit, extended by a creditor, or extended to a consumer. Note that the definitions for closed-end mortgage loan and open-end line of credit apply to the loan volume thresholds discussed earlier. First, an extension of credit refers to a new debt obligation. In general, if the transaction modifies, renews, extends, 
or amends the debt obligation, but does not satisfy and replace it, the transaction would not be considered an extension of credit under Regulation C. Note that the term extension of credit has a different meaning under Regulation B, which interprets the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Under Regulation B, Section 1002.2Q, extension of credit means the granting of credit in any form, including the renewal of credit and the continuance of existing credit in some circumstances. Under Regulation C, the term extension of credit generally refers to the granting of credit pursuant to a new debt obligation. However, there are two types of transactions that are considered extensions of credit under the final rule, even though they may not involve new debt obligations. One type of transaction is an assumption. Some assumptions have historically been covered under Regulation C. For purposes of Regulation C, an assumption is a transaction in which the financial institution enters into a written agreement accepting a new borrower as the obligor on an existing obligation. In such a situation, no new debt obligation is created, but rather the new borrower assumes an existing debt obligation. Under the final rule, assumptions include successor and interest transactions, which are transactions in which an individual succeeds the prior owner as the property owner, and then takes on the existing debt secured by the property. The other type of transaction that does not necessarily involve a new debt obligation, but is reported, is a transaction pursuant to a New York State Consolidation, Extension, and Modification Agreement, also known as SEMAs, and classified as a supplemental mortgage under New York Tax Law Section 255 such that the borrower owed reduced or no mortgage recording taxes. New York SEMAs are loans secured by dwellings located in New York State and often may be used in place of traditional refinancings, either to amend the interest rate or loan term, or permit the borrower to take cash out. The second test for both a closed-end mortgage loan and open-end line of credit is whether the transaction was secured by a lien on a dwelling. A dwelling is a residential structure whether or not it is attached to real property. A dwelling is not limited to a principal residence, nor is it limited to a structure that has four or less units. Here are some examples of dwellings. Second homes and vacation homes, investment properties, manufactured homes or other factory built homes. A transaction related to a manufactured home community is secured by a dwelling under Regulation C even if it is not secured by individual manufactured homes but only by the land that constitutes that manufactured home community, including sites for manufactured homes. Multifamily residential structures or communities such as apartments, condominiums, and cooperative buildings, or complexes, or manufactured homes. Certain structures or properties are not considered dwellings under Regulation C. Here are some examples. Recreational vehicles, for example, boats, campers, travel trailers, and park model recreational vehicles. Houseboats, floating homes, and mobile homes constructed before June 15, 1976 are not considered dwellings, even if they are used as residences. Transitory residences are also not considered dwellings. Examples of transitory residences include hotels, hospitals, and college dorms. Lastly, structures that were originally designed as a dwelling but converted to exclusive commercial use for example, a home converted to a professional office are not considered dwellings. Certain properties may be used for both a residential and commercial purpose. An example would be a building that has both apartment units and retail space. A financial institution would need to determine, using any reasonable standard, the primary use of the property, such as square footage or income generated, 
and may select the standard on a case-by-case -case basis. If the property's primary use is residential, then it would be considered a dwelling. Let's recap. A closed-end mortgage loan is an extension of credit secured by a lien on a dwelling and that is not an open-end line of credit. What is an open-end line of credit? Section 1003.20 provides that an open-end line of credit is an extension of credit secured by a dwelling and that is an open-end credit plan under Regulation Z Section 1026.2A20, but without regard to whether the credit is consumer credit, extended by a creditor, or extended to a consumer. Open-end credit is one in which the creditor reasonably contemplates repeated transactions. The creditor may impose a finance charge from time to time on an outstanding unpaid balance. And the amount of credit that may be extended to the borrower during the term of the plan, up to the limit established by the creditor, is generally made available to the extent that any outstanding balance is repaid. There are 12 types of transactions that are specifically excluded from Regulation C. These are provided in Section 1003.3C in the final rule. We will review several of these types of transactions. First, a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit that is secured by a lien on unimproved land. A loan or line of credit is secured by a lien on unimproved land if the loan or line of credit is secured by vacant or unimproved property. However, the exclusion will not apply if the institution knows, based on information that it receives from the applicant or borrower at the time the application is received or the credit decision is made, that the proceeds of that loan or credit line will be used within two years after closing or account opening to construct a dwelling on or to purchase a dwelling to be placed on the land. For example, if the applicant tells the financial institution that funds from the loan will be used to construct a dwelling on the land within two years after closing, then the transaction is reportable in the financial institution's HMDA data if it is otherwise reportable. Note that if the transaction meets another exclusion, such as the temporary financing exclusion under section 1003.3 C3, then the transaction is not reportable. Second, a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit that is temporary financing. Temporary financing is not determined by the duration of the loan, but rather whether the transaction is designed to be replaced by permanent financing at a later time. An example of a transaction obtained for temporary financing is a construction loan where the proceeds will be used to finance the construction phase of the dwelling and where a new extension of credit will later be obtained for permanent financing. Here, the loan to fund the construction phase would be excluded as a temporary financing. On the other hand, if the transaction is a construction to permanent loan, where the proceeds will be used to finance the construction of a dwelling, but the loan will automatically be converted to permanent financing without a separate closing once construction is complete, the transaction is not excluded as temporary financing. Third, a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit that is used primarily for agricultural purposes. A loan or line of credit is used primarily for agricultural purposes if the proceeds will be primarily for agricultural purposes or if the loan or line of credit is secured by a dwelling located on real property that is used primarily for an agricultural purpose, such as a farm. The institution may use any reasonable standard to determine the primary use of the property and may select any reasonable standard to apply on a case-by-case -case basis. What is meant by agricultural purpose? Regulation C looks to Regulation Z's commentary. Fourth, a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit that is or will be made primarily for a business or commercial purpose. However, if the financial institution determines that the proceeds of a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit will primarily be used for a commercial or business purpose, but that it also meets the Regulation C definition of a home improvement loan, home purchase loan, or a refinancing, then the transaction would be a covered loan unless another exclusion applies. 
an example of a commercial or business purpose transaction that will be covered under Regulation C, unless another exclusion applies, is a closed-end mortgage loan to purchase a multifamily dwelling secured by the dwelling. Another example of a commercial or business purpose transaction that will be covered under Regulation C, unless another exclusion applies, is a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit to improve an office that is located in a dwelling. The loan proceeds will be used primarily for business or commercial purposes, but the loan is a home improvement loan under Regulation C. An example of a transaction with a business or commercial primary purpose that would not be covered under Regulation C is a closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit where the proceeds will be used primarily to expand a business that is not located in a dwelling. Another example is where the proceeds of the closed-end mortgage loan or open-end line of credit will be used primarily to purchase business equipment. In both cases, the loan or line of credit does not also meet the definition of home improvement, home purchase, loan, or a refinancing. Such transactions would be excluded even if the transactions were cross-collateralized by a covered loan. The final topic to point out in the category of excluded transactions is that a financial institution may not have to report data on all of its covered loans. The final rule includes transactional thresholds that exclude either closed-end mortgage loans or open-end lines of credit depending on whether it originated fewer than 25 closed-end mortgage loans or 100 open-end lines of credit in either of the two preceding calendar years. As mentioned earlier, a financial institution will not be required to collect, record, and report closed-end mortgage loans if it originated fewer than 25 of them in either of the two preceding calendar years. Similarly, a financial institution will not be required to collect, record, and report open-end lines of credit if it originated fewer than 100 of them in either of the two preceding calendar years. Some institutions may meet the threshold for reporting closed-end mortgage loans, but not open-end lines of credit, and therefore would be required to collect and report data on closed-end mortgage loans only. On the other hand, some institutions may meet the threshold for open-end lines of credit, but not closed-end mortgage loans, and therefore would be required to collect and report data on open-end lines of credit only. There are two typographical errors in Section 1003.3c of the final rule that affect the exclusions we discussed. Section 1003.3c11 states that a closed-end mortgage loan is excluded if the financial institution originated fewer than 25 closed-end mortgage loans in each of the two preceding calendar years. The Bureau intended that a financial institution that originated fewer than 25 closed-end mortgage loans in either of the two preceding calendar years will not be required to report HMDA data on closed-end mortgage loans. This means that a financial institution will be required to report HMDA data on closed-end mortgage loans only if it originated at least 25 closed-end mortgage loans in each of the two preceding calendar years. Similarly, Section 1003.3 C12 states that an open-end line of credit is excluded if the financial institution originated fewer than 100 open-end lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years. The Bureau intended that a financial institution that originated fewer than 100 open-end lines of credit in either of the two preceding calendar years will not be required to report HMDA data on open-end lines of credit. This means that a financial institution will be required to report HMDA data on open-end lines of credit only if it originated at least 100 open-end lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years. The Bureau is considering whether clarifying action would be appropriate. Let's review the following table and discuss scenarios where an institution would or would not be obligated to report closed-end mortgage loans or open-end lines of credit. In the table with the loan volume threshold examples, Institution A originated 30 closed-end mortgage loans in 2016 and 24 in 2017. For open-end lines of credit, Institution A originated 1,000 in 2016 and 1,200 in 2017. In this scenario, 
Institution A will be required to collect data on open end lines of credit in 2018 for submission in 2019 because the number of open end lines of credit it originated in both 2016 and 2017 exceeded the threshold of at least 100. Institution A will not be required to collect data on its closed end mortgage loans because it did not originate at least 25 closed end mortgage loans in both 2016 and 2017. Let's take a look at Institution B's lending activity. In 2016, Institution B originated 30 closed end mortgage loans and 99 open end lines of credit. In 2017, Institution B originated 45 closed end mortgage loans and 105 open end lines of credit. For 2018 data collection for submission in 2019, Institution B will only be required to collect data on its closed end mortgage loans because for both 2016 and 2017, it originated at least 25 closed end mortgage loans. It will not be required to collect data on its open end lines of credit because it originated only 99 open end lines of credit in 2016. Let's move on to Institution C's origination volumes. In 2016, Institution C originated 55 closed-end mortgage loans and 150 in 2017. For its open-end lines of credit, it originated 150 in 2016 and 200 in 2017. Here, Institution C will be required to collect data on its 2018 closed-end mortgage loans and open-end lines of credit because unlike Institutions A and B, Institution C's origination volumes for closed end and open end met or exceeded the loan volume thresholds for both 2016 and 2017. Now let's look at an example of an institution that would not be required to collect and report data because its loan volume activity did not meet or exceed the threshold in one or both years. Institution D originated 22 closed end mortgage loans in 2016 and in 2017 it originated 26 closed end loans. In 2016, Institution D originated 98 open end lines of credit and in 2017 it originated 30 open end lines of credit. Institution D will not be required to collect HMDA data for 2018 because it did not meet the loan volume test. The next few slides make up a chart that will walk you through one way of analyzing whether a transaction is covered under the final rule. This chart is available on the Bureau's HMDA implementation webpage. This first page of the chart contains an overview of some of the suggested key questions to consider when determining whether the transaction involves a covered loan. The first step is to determine whether the transaction is excluded based on its purpose. Remember that a transaction that is primarily for agricultural purposes is excluded, even if it is secured by a dwelling. A transaction that is primarily for a business or commercial purpose could possibly be excluded. It would depend on whether the transaction is also a home improvement loan, home purchase loan, or a refinancing. If the transaction is not excluded based on its purpose, then the next question is to determine whether the transaction is secured by a lien on a dwelling. This page of the chart provides examples of what is and what is not a dwelling. Next, determine if the transaction involves an extension of credit. To answer this question, ask whether the transaction is pursuant to a new debt obligation. If not, it generally will not be an extension of credit and will not be a covered transaction. However, you will need to confirm whether the transaction is an assumption or a transaction completed pursuant to New York State SEMAs. Under the final rule, these types of transactions are extensions of credit even if there is no new debt obligation. The final step in the analysis is to determine whether the transaction is excluded for other reasons. This page of the chart illustrates how meeting the loan volume threshold for closed-end loans or open-end lines of credit will require the institution to collect and report all of the applicable transactions in the category of loan volume thresholds that the institution meets. However, an institution may not be required to report data on closed-end loans or open-end lines of credit if it did not originate the minimum threshold in each of the two preceding calendar years. 
covered consumer and business or commercial purpose originations should be counted together when determining whether the institution met the threshold minimum. As mentioned earlier in this webinar, if the institution originated the minimum number of closed-end mortgage loans but not open-end lines of credit, then it would need to report only the covered closed-end mortgage loans, including applications that did not result in an origination. It will not need to report data on open-end lines of credit. Let's discuss when an institution reports a covered transaction. Once a financial institution has determined that the transaction is covered, it must determine whether it has engaged in activity that obligates it to report information about the transaction. A financial institution collects and reports information for actions taken on applications for covered loans, originations of covered loans, and purchases of covered loans. If the application did not result in an originated covered loan, a financial institution collects and reports the application if the financial institution took action on the application or even if the application was withdrawn while the financial institution was reviewing it. If a financial institution receives an application and then the application results in an origination, the financial institution would report only the origination of the covered loan rather than reporting separately the application and the origination. So what is an application? An application is an oral or written request for a covered loan that is made in accordance with the procedures the financial institution uses for the type of credit requested. A request for a pre-approval is considered an application under Regulation C if the request is for a home purchase loan that is not secured by a multifamily dwelling, that is not for an open-end line of credit or reverse mortgage, and that is reviewed under a pre-approval program. A pre-approval program is one in which the financial institution conducts a comprehensive analysis of the applicant's credit worthiness, resources, and other matters typically reviewed as part of the financial institution's credit evaluation program, and then it issues a written commitment that is for a home purchase loan valid for a designated period of time up to a specified amount and subject to only specifically permitted conditions. The permitted conditions are conditions that require the identification of a suitable property, conditions that require no material change occur regarding the applicant's financial condition or credit worthiness prior to closing, and limited conditions that are not related to the applicant's financial condition or credit worthiness and the financial institution ordinarily attaches to a traditional home mortgage application. For example, the requirement of an acceptable title insurance binder or a certificate indicating a clear termite inspection. A financial institution is required to report data on pre-approval requests only if the pre-approval request is denied, results in the origination of a home purchase loan, or was approved but not accepted. Let's move on to who reports the transaction when there are multiple entities involved. Currently, Regulation C refers to this as the broker rule. The final rule does not change the rules for determining which institution reports a particular transaction, but has moved the comment that addresses this issue to Section 1003.4a and provides additional examples to help you better understand which institution reports. Only one financial institution reports each originated covered loan as an origination. The financial institution that made the credit decision approving the application before closing or account opening reports the loan as an origination regardless of whether the loan closed in the institution's name. This is also how an institution determines whether it has originated a particular loan 
for the purposes of institutional coverage criteria and transactional thresholds that we discussed a moment ago. Let's walk through one example. Elm Bank received an application for a covered loan from an applicant and forwarded that application to Oak Bank. Oak Bank reviewed the application and approved the loan prior to closing. The loan closed in Elm Bank's name. Oak Bank purchased the loan from Elm Bank after closing. Oak Bank was not acting as Elm Bank's agent. Since Oak Bank made the credit decision prior to closing, Oak Bank reports the transaction as an origination, not as a purchase, and reports all of the data fields required for originated loans. Elm Bank does not report the transaction. Oak Bank also counts this loan as an origination for purposes of the institutional coverage and transactional coverage tests. What happens when more than one institution approved an application prior to closing or account opening and one of those institutions purchased the loan after closing? In this case, the institution that approved the application before closing and purchased the loan after closing reports the loan as an origination. A financial institution reports the action it took on all applications that it receives. It does not matter whether the financial institution received the application from the applicant or from a broker or another financial institution. It also does not matter if the application for a covered transaction does not result in an origination. If an institution made the credit decision through the actions of an agent as defined by state law, the institution reports the application or origination. For example, Ficus Bank, acting as Elm Bank's agent, receives an application for a closed-down mortgage loan and makes a credit decision approving the loan. The applicant does not, however, accept the loan. Who reports the transaction? Here, Elm Bank would report the action taken by its agent Ficus Bank and would report the application as approved but not accepted. Ficus Bank would not report the application because it was acting as an agent of Elm Bank. Institutions may have a variety of relationships with other institutions and such relationships may play a role in determining which institution reports in a given situation. We encourage you to review comments 4A-2 through 4, which address additional scenarios, including those that industry, during the comment period, asks the Bureau to address. This includes how to report if an institution makes a credit decision using another entity's underwriting criteria and how this plays out when more than one institution is involved. Moving on, there are a few changes the final rule makes to the reporting process. First, Beginning with data collected in 2017 and submitted by March 1, 2018, financial institutions must submit their HMDA data electronically. The final rule retains the requirement that the financial institution must submit its data to the appropriate federal agency by March 1 following the calendar year for which it collected the data. The agencies have agreed that beginning with data collected in 2017, to be submitted by March 1, 2018, financial institutions will file their HMDA data with the Bureau. The Bureau is developing a new web-based tool for electronically submitting HMDA data. Additional information regarding this tool will be provided later this year on the Bureau's HMDA webpage at www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash HMDA. Second, Beginning with data collected in 2018 and submitted by March 1, 2019, financial institutions must submit their HMDA data electronically in accordance with revised submission procedures. Appendix A, which includes instructions for completing and submitting the HMDA Loan Application Register, 
will apply to data collected in 2017 and reported in 2018, but will be removed from Regulation C beginning on January 1, 2019. Finally, effective on January 1, 2020, larger volume reporters, those financial institutions that reported at least 60,000 combined covered loans and applications, excluding purchase covered loans, for the preceding calendar year will be required to report data on a quarterly basis. These financial institutions must report all data required to be recorded for the calendar quarter within 60 calendar days after the end of the calendar quarter. If a financial institution makes a good faith effort to fully and accurately report its quarterly data, and some data are nevertheless inaccurate or incomplete, those deficiencies do not violate HMDA or Regulation C, provided that the institution corrects or completes the data prior to submitting its annual loan application register. Quarterly reporting will not apply to a financial institution's fourth quarter data. Instead, the financial institution reports its fourth quarter data as part of its annual submission. The financial institution's annual submission must contain the data for the first three calendar quarters, including any corrections, plus its fourth quarter data. For example, if Ficus Bank reported 60,000 covered loans and applications in its 2019 HMDA data, it will meet the requirements to be a quarterly reporter and will be required to report its January 1st through March 31st, 2020 HMDA activity by May 30th, 2020. Its second quarter data will be due by August 30th, 2020, and its third quarter data will be due by November 30th, 2020. FICUS Bank will then submit its fourth quarter data, along with the previously submitted first, second, and third quarter data, including corrections, by March 1st, 2021. Financial institutions that do not report at least 60,000 covered loans and applications in the preceding calendar year are not required to submit quarterly HMDA data. For example, if Pine Bank reported 59,999 covered loans and applications in 2019, then it will not be required to report its 2020 data on a quarterly basis. The final rule makes a few changes to the disclosure of data. Let's discuss these changes. Beginning in 2018, with respect to data collected in 2017 and later years, the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, known as the FFIEC, shall provide notice to the financial institution that its disclosure statement, based on data submitted for the prior calendar year, is available. The financial institution must make available to the public no later than three days after receiving notice from the FFIEC a written notice that clearly conveys that the financial institution's disclosure statement may be obtained from the Bureau's HMDA webpage at www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash HMDA. The notice may be available in paper or electronic form. Here is a sample notice. The suggested language for the notice can be found in comment 5B-3. The financial institution must make the notice available to the public for a period of five years. A financial institution may also provide its disclosure statement to a requester and charge a reasonable fee for costs incurred in reproducing or providing the statement. If a financial institution opts to provide its disclosure statement to a requester, it must still comply with the notice requirement. Another change is the change related to a financial institution's obligation to disclose its modified loan application register. Beginning in 2018, with respect to data collected in 2017 and later years, upon request from a member of the public, a financial institution must provide a written notice regarding the availability of the modified loan application register. The notice must clearly convey that the financial institution's loan application register, as modified by the Bureau to protect applicant and borrower privacy, may be obtained on the Bureau's HMDA webpage at 
www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash humda. A financial institution may use this sample notice. The suggested language for the notice can be found in comment 5C-2. The financial institution must make the notice available to the public for a period of three years. A financial institution may also provide its modified loan application register to a requester and charge a reasonable fee for costs incurred in reproducing or providing the modified loan application register. If a financial institution opts to provide its modified loan application register to a requester, it must still comply with the notice requirement. Our final topic today is an overview of the effective dates for the various provisions of the rule. Here is a key dates timeline available on the Bureau's HMDA implementation webpage. This timeline summarizes the effective dates for various provisions of the final rule and it also illustrates when data collection would begin and when the data collected must be submitted because those two activities generally occur in two different calendar years. The changes to depository institution coverage discussed earlier in this webinar takes effect on January 1, 2017. Then on January 1, 2018, most provisions related to institutional and transactional coverage data collection, recording, reporting, and disclosure become effective. A financial institution collects, records, and reports data points under the final rule for applications on which final action is taken on or after January 1, 2018. The date of final action is based on the final disposition of the application. This may be weeks or months after the application is received. Let's review the dates to be reported for the final action taken on an application. This page summarizes the dates to be reported. For example, for a loan that was originated, the date of final action to be reported is generally the date the loan closed or in the case of an open-end line of credit, the date the account was opened. The final rule provides some flexibility regarding the date of final action to be reported on originations. For example, comment 4A8 Romanet 2-5 explains that for a construction to permanent loan, the institution can report either the date of loan closing or account opening, or the date the loan converted to permanent financing. Even with the flexibility the rule provides, the institution must still report the origination as occurring in the year in which the origination goes to closing or the account is opened. For applications approved but not accepted, an institution may choose any reasonable date, including the approval date, the deadline that was established for accepting the offer, or the date the file was closed. Although the institution does not need to use the same approach for its entire submission, the institution should be consistent, such as using the same approach for a category of loans. For files closed for incompleteness, the institution may report the date the file was closed or the date the notice was sent to the applicant. Note, however, that a pre-approval request that was withdrawn or closed for incompleteness is not HMDA reportable. As we discussed, the effective date is tied to the date on which final action is taken on the application. This may be weeks or months after the application date. The chart on this page provides examples of applications received in both 2017 and 2018 and where final action is taken in 2017 and 2018. The chart further illustrates what should be collected and by when it must be reported. For example, an application that is received on October 1, 2017, with a loan origination date of December 1, 2017, is reportable with the institution's 2017 HMDA data to be submitted by March 1, 2018. The data to be collected would be in accordance with the rule in effect in 2017. This means that for this loan, the institution would not collect the new data points under the final rule. On the other hand, an application that is received on October 1, 2017 
with a loan origination date of January 5, 2018, is reportable with the institution's 2018 HMDA data to be submitted by March 1, 2019. A financial institution reports the covered loans it purchased based on the date of purchase. For example, if the financial institution purchases a covered loan on October 1, 2017, then it would report that purchase with its 2017 HMDA data to be submitted by March 1, 2018. On the other hand, if the financial institution purchases a covered loan on January 5, 2018, then it would report the purchase in accordance with the final rule with its 2018 HMDA data to be submitted by March 1, 2019. If a financial institution will be a covered institution in 2018, it will need a way to collect the 2018 data points for applications on which final action is taken in 2018, even if the application is received in 2017. Unless the institution knows whether final action will be taken in 2018, it may need to collect both the 2017 and the 2018 data points for the same transaction. As a reminder, the final rule modifies certain data points and adds others, including data points for age, credit score, automated underwriting information, debt to income ratio, unique loan identifier, property value, application channel, points and fees, and loan term. We will discuss these data points in subsequent webinars. One exception to the general rule that the effective date is tied to the date of final action is a collection of information about ethnicity, race, and sex. The effective date for collection of the new race and ethnicity categories is tied to the application date. Comment 4A10, Romanet 1-2, explains that if an application is received before January 1, 2018, the final action is not taken until on or after January 1, 2018, the financial institution complies with the final rule if it collects the applicant's race, ethnicity, and sex in accordance with the requirements in effect at the time of application. As an example, let's assume an application is received on October 1, 2017, and final action is taken on January 5, 2018, as shown on this chart. The financial institution would collect and report the data in accordance with the final rule, except for the race, ethnicity, and sex categories. This information must be collected in accordance with the Appendix B instructions in effect in 2017, at the time of application. Now for an application that is received February 15, 2018, and where final action is taken on March 15, 2018, the financial institution would collect and report the data in accordance with the final rule and would also collect the race, ethnicity, and sex information in accordance with the amended Appendix B instructions under the final rule. Another change that becomes effective on January 1, 2018 is that financial institutions will be required to submit their data electronically using the new web-based tool developed by the Bureau. This means that beginning with the data that the financial institution collects in 2017, the financial institution must submit it electronically by March 1, 2018. Also effective in 2018 is a requirement to provide the, to the public, upon request, notices that the institution's disclosure statement and modified loan application register are available on the Bureau's website. On January 1, 2019, changes to the enforcement provisions become effective. The enforcement provisions provide that when the quarterly reporting requirements become effective, Inaccuracies or omissions in quarterly reporting are not violations of HMDA or Regulation C if the financial institution makes a good faith effort to report quarterly data timely, fully, and accurately, and then corrects or completes the data prior to its annual submission. 
As noted, beginning in 2020, a large volume financial institution will be required to collect and report its HMDA data on a quarterly basis. Recall that a larger volume financial institution is one that reported at least 60,000 covered loans and applications, excluding purchase covered loans, in the preceding calendar year. For example, a financial institution that reported 59,999 covered loans and applications for their 2019 data will not be required to submit quarterly data in 2020. However, a financial institution that reported 60,000 covered loans and applications for their 2019 data will be required to submit quarterly data in 2020. The first quarter data will be due by May 30, 2020. We hope you found this webinar helpful. The Bureau has additional resources to help you understand and comply with the final rule. These are available on the Bureau's website at www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash policy dash compliance forward slash guidance forward slash implementation dash guidance. Click on the link for the HUMDA rule. You can also submit feedback via a link on that web page. Specific regulatory interpretation questions may be submitted to CFPB underscore reg inquiries at CFPB.gov. Please specify HMDA in the subject line and provide regulatory sites to indicate the topic of the question. If you do not have email access, you may leave a voicemail with your question at 202-435 7700. Technical questions about collecting HMDA data in 2017 and later years or reporting HMDA data in 2018 and later years should be directed to humdahelp at cfpb.gov or 855-438-2372. Thank you for joining us in this webinar.